Hey ladies, are you feeling overwhelmed by hormonal changes? Well, you're definitely not alone. There are more than 1,000 hormone disruptors living in our environment right now. It's sending your food, your water, the air you breathe, the clothes you wear, your skincare products. They all mess with your hormones. Then there's the natural hormone changes your body goes through. Premenopause, menopause. And while it's a natural process, it doesn't mean you have to suffer through it. The good news is you don't have to suffer through it anymore because now you have hormone harmony, a formula made only with herbal ingredients that are shown to reduce hormonal symptoms in women of all ages. Hormone harmony is not just a hormone support and supplement. It's become a phenomenon. Women can't stop talking about it on social media. A bottle of hormone harmony is sold every 24 seconds. And the biggest benefit? Well, my wife says it makes her feel like her own self again. And that's what women mention over and over in the reviews. And there are over 30,000 reviews for Hormone Harmony. And for a limited time, you can get 15% off your entire first order at happymammoth.com. Just use code RLRC at checkout. That's happymammoth.com and use code RLRC for 15% off today. That's H-A-P-P-Y-M-A-M-M-O-T-H dot com and use code R-L-R-C. Oh, 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 O'Reilly. You've got questions? O'Reilly Auto Parts has answers. Need a pro you can trust? We've got that too. No matter what you need, our professional parts people have the training and expertise to help you do things right. Deep automotive knowledge, just one part that makes O'Reilly stand apart. The professional parts people. Oh, 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 O'Reilly. Auto Parts. With everyone looking to shrink their bill these days, Dunn Stores gives you new ways to save on your shop with double savers. First, you'll save in the aisles when you fill your basket with fantastic low prices across thousands of great products. Then you'll save again at the till with our 5 off 25 grocery voucher. Shrink your bill with Double Savers, new from Dunn Stores. Dunn Stores, always better value. Terms and conditions apply. Voucher can be used on next in-store grocery shop of 25 euro or more. Hello, I love sugar in my coffee. It me me. Warning, Real Life, Real Crime, the podcast, should be for listeners that are 18 years of older, as each episode may contain strong adult language and descriptions of acts of violence or of a sexual nature that were told to me by the victims of the crimes or the criminals who perpetrated the crimes against the victims. Please use this as your warning. Thank you. Hello, everybody, and welcome to this episode of Real Life, Real Crime, the podcast. I'm Woody Overton, your host, and today we'll be concluding our two-part series of Until Death Do Us Part. Before we get started, I want to give a shout-out to all our fans again. Y'all are unreal. Response is unbelievable. We were number two in the United States on Apple Podcast Charts on Chartable. We were number one in Australia this week and number one in Ireland and reached number four in Great Britain. And we did it because of all y'all. You're incredible and we love each and every one of you. And we want to remind you about our closed group page on Facebook under Real Life Real Crime where you can send us a requests to be added to the page and we'll approve you and you'll have more access to bonus material if you will for each episode which will include press releases on the cases and pictures of the perps and some pictures of homicide locations and things like that and court documents so send us a request to be added and we'll get you added we have great moderators 
of the group and they take care of the page and they're awesome also just thanks to everybody and let's get started on april 4th 2007 i was working as a detective with the livingston parish sheriff's office and i was in my office at the courthouse in the town of livingston and i had just come in from the field from taking somebody to jail and man let me tell you it was a beautiful spring day just about the prettiest day you could imagine for South Louisiana, it was like 74 degrees, not a cloud in the sky, and almost no humidity, which is unheard of for down here in South Louisiana. And it's just a gorgeous day. And to be honest with you, I kind of already checked out mentally. It was about 2 o'clock in the afternoon, and we had off Good Friday for Easter coming up, and this was a Wednesday, so I planned on taking off Thursday and having a good old crawfish boil and then going fishing with my father on Friday. But I was in my office, and my partner, Jim Raffman, who is a great guy, Jim was like me. He wasn't from Livingston Parish originally. He was on the... 2003 LSU National Championship football team and after he left LSU he joined the sheriff's office in uniform patrol and quickly worked his way up to the detective super smart guy he would end up completing his college degree while he was a detective and enlisting in the army and becoming up to the rank of captain and he actually won a bronze star for his heroic actions in Afghanistan anyway Jim it was kind of like my protege, if you will. He was one of my best friends and, and just a solid guy, super smart. But he came in and he said, hey, man, we got a roll. We got a 10-7 in, in Walker at the Popeyes. And 10-7 is cop speak for a dead body. And I told him, so, okay, I'll meet you over there. And I went down and got in my vehicle and took off. And I turned on our police band radio, which had three different tacks at that time. TACs are basically channels, and TAC 1 was for the west side of the parish, which covers the most populated side, and, and then you had TAC 2, which covered the east side of the parish, is, which includes the rural areas and a bunch of small towns, and then TAC 3 was for the special response team or SWAT team or scrambled communications. Anyway, so I had it on TAC 1, and I heard the dispatch say TAC 1 is... 1033 the net for TAC 1. What 1033 means is hold all traffic except for emergency traffic, and they only do that in times of emergency. Everybody else that was on TAC 1 that had day-to-day traffic to communicate had to go to TAC 2. But they said hold TAC 1 is 1033, hold the net. And during this time, people were responding to the Popeyes and Walker in the area, and I heard them say that units as they were arriving on the scene and i heard them giving their unit number and their location and they were setting up a perimeter it was actually a manhunt going on and i didn't know that at this time jim just came in and told me we had 10-7 but evidently there was a manhunt underway and so they were establishing a perimeter and they called for the helicopter they called for the louisiana state police crime lab they called for the coroner and they called for the special response team and for a canine handler to come and track the suspect that had run. And normally it takes about 15 minutes to drive to walk from the town of Livingston. We probably made it there in about five and we were rolling pretty hard, pretty fast to get to the scene. And upon my arrival, of course there were cop cars everywhere and pulled up to the side of the Popeyes and uh, they already were taping off the area with crime scene tape and I get out and Jim gets out and we go up. There were several other detectives there from the sheriff's office, Stan Carpenter and Chuck Watts and Ben Ballard and many others but we met with Chief Hunter Grimes of the Walker Police Department who like I said in the previous episode is a good friend of mine that we worked uniform patrol and we're on a special response team together before he left to go to Walker City Police Department to be their chief and we met up and said hey Hunter what do we have and he said we got a dead female, her husband came in and shot her and then evidently slit her throat in the back of the Popeyes. And when I looked, I could actually see the back rear corner of the building where the door was. There was a body laying half in and out the door, if you will. And Hunter said, what do we need to do? And Hunter had with him Chris Dufour, who was Walker's main investigative officer. And Chris is a super cop, great guy, but he just didn't 
it didn't have the knowledge on working homicides. It, Walker hadn't had one in probably 10 or 15 years. So and I told him, I said, this is what we're going to do. Get all the witnesses, separate them, and get their statements individually. And we're going to go do a walkthrough on the crime scene and we'll, while y'all are getting the statements, and then we'll meet back up. And y'all, the reason you take statements individually on a situation like this is because in a small space, when a violent crime occurs, eyewitness testimony is just pretty basically horrible because you could put have 10 different people in the room and, and have gunfire go off and you'll get 10 different descriptions as to what the perpetrator looked like, et cetera. And so we didn't want one witness testimony affecting the other one if they overheard them talking to the officers. So they went and began the interviews and Detective Chuck Watts and I went and made entrance into the Popeyes through the the main patron door. And we were told uh, already that she was shot at the front counter. And obviously, like I said, I could see the body in the back door. And they said she was shot and she ran through to the back of the store and the perpetrator followed her. And then the perpetrator had run out of the back door across one of the fields, the vacant fields around the Popeyes. So we, we go in, and there was a little bit of blood up front by the counter, and you go behind the counter, you take a right, and then you take a left, and it goes straight back to the to the rear door. And we didn't have to get within 10 feet of the body, and I could tell just by the huge amount of blood that it was a pretty traumatic death. And even from 10 feet away, I could see the damage to the victim's throat. Even at a, at a distance, it, it was it was very noticeable. I look up, and right above the back door is a godsend, is a camera pointing down, covering the door. So I'm like, I told Chuck, yes, we got it, man. And no matter what happens, we'll have the video, right? This is Popeye's. It was a pretty new location. I think it had only been there for a couple of years. And this is Popeye's. This is a nationwide chain, so I know their stuff's working, right? And, and we, so we retraced our steps back out to the front, and there were several cameras located through the store. And we go back out and meet Hunter again, and they had statements, and we met to talk about what happened. And they said that that day, one of the employees had gone outside to take the trash out to the dumpster, and they saw Christopher Pell hiding by the trash dumpster. And the girl went back inside, and about 45 minutes later, the assistant manager, Tony Harrell, was getting off work. And so she went out and met her ride in the rear parking lot of the Popeyes. And she saw Christopher Pell still standing there. And she's like, what are you doing? He said, I'm waiting to talk to Jana. And she said, well, you can't wait out here, man. You need to go inside. And so he did. And so she's getting in the car and preparing to leave. And she said that she had a uneasy feeling. So she told her friend to stop. She said, look, I, I got to go back inside. And so she proceeded to head back into the store. At this time, inside the store, the manager, Josh Cox, was in his office, and he heard someone say, give me the phone, in a loud, angry voice. And he walked out to see what was going on, and he saw Christopher Pell standing in front of Jana Pell, and he laid a pistol on the counter. And Cox told him, he said, put that pistol up and get out of here. And as soon as he said that, Pell picks up the pistol. And at the same time, Tony Harrell's coming back into the door, and she sees this happen. And Pell picks up the pistol, and he shoots Jana one time in the right shoulder. And then all hell breaks loose, right? The people are screaming, and, and one patron that was there with her grandson hit under the table. And all the employees in, in the back took off running for the back door, including the manager, Cox, and everybody's running right and Jana takes off also and Pell goes behind the counter after her the only person who didn't run was Tony Harrell the assistant manager she actually is the hero of the day in my book she pursued Pell behind the counter even though he was still carrying a pistol and she said he was calm he was walking after Jana and he was dead focused on her and uh, she was like, come on, man, you got to get out of here. Come on, man, don't do this. Don't do this. And Pell didn't respond. And she picked up a fire extinguisher and threatened Pell with it. She said, come on, man, don't do this. I'm going to hit you with this fire extinguisher. And she said, Pell just real nonchalantly laid the 
pistol on the counter and she grabbed it. Harold grabbed the pistol and ran back out the front. And as she's running out the front door, the employees were in that back corner where I had parked my vehicle, uh, gathered up and she ran to him. She said, I got the gun. I got the gun. But she also could hear Jana screaming from the back doorway. And Jana was saying, oh God, help me, help me. Somebody help me. Oh God. And, but they thought that Christopher Pell was just beating on her physically. She had the gun. But what they didn't know was he was armed with a knife and, and he was brutally murdering her. Harold says she saw Christopher Pell take off out of the back door and run across one of the fields. In that time, she and another patron over there, a Marine that was home on leave, went to Jana Pell and tried to give medical assistance, but they said it was just horrible that her throat was slit and she actually was holding her hand and felt her last heartbeat. As she died, they stayed with her until the police and the medics got there. So I told him, I said, it's okay. I said, you know, so we know who he is, but even better, we have video. So let's talk to Cox and and see if they have to download the video from Popeye's headquarters or is it something we can get here. And so we go to Josh Cox, the manager, and I'm like, Mr. Cox, I'm a detective over to the sheriff's office. And I understand that you already gave your statement, but I need to ask you about the camera system. I said, how do we get the, the download of the video so we can see what happened? I said, the cameras are perfect. You have one right over the back door. And he just kind of looked at me and sat there, and he was silent for a second. I said, please tell me your cameras are working. And he, he just met me with a dead silence. I mean, y'all work plenty of crimes in the hood and different places at small stores that have fake cameras or their cameras are never working. But this is Popeye's, right? Surely their cameras are working. But Cox told me, he said, he said, no, man. He said the cameras hadn't worked for a while. I'm like, you got to be shitting me. Are you serious? And so, all right, I thanked him and we went up and you know, I made sure that the scene was secure and you have an we place an officer there to take names of anybody that would have to enter the scene, the coroner or whomever. You have to take their name and the time that they enter the scene and what time they leave the scene. And that's for trial purposes, uh, evidence purposes. So if you leave some DNA behind or a defense attorney can't come back and say, oh, well, you had 50 cops running through the scene and they messed up all the evidence, like on the O.J. Simpson case. But when I establish a scene in the perimeter, nobody gets in. After we do our initial walkthrough until the Louisiana State Police Crime Lab gets there to collect the evidence, no one gets in. I don't care who you are. If you're the sheriff or the governor of Louisiana, it doesn't matter. It's it's my scene. You don't get in. And we're, we're going to maintain. Spark something uncommon this holiday with just the right gift from Uncommon Goods. The busy holiday season is here, and Uncommon Goods makes it less stressful with incredible hand-picked gifts for everyone on your list, all in one spot. Gifts to spark joy, wonder, delight, and that's exactly what I want it feeling. Hey, y'all, I ordered... A super cool piece. It's a candle with a sculpture of an LSU Tiger Stadium on top of it. And each officially licensed laser-cut wooden replica features up to four layers of detail, creating a bird's-eye view of a specific football field, seating section, and more. And every label includes your stadium's name, the team's logo, and school location. And it has a coconut soy vegan wax infused with sandalwood smell that creates tailgates and touchdowns scent profile, reminiscent of game day. It's invigorating like fresh-cut grass and nostalgic like smoke from a pre-game grill. In common, like the crisp autumn air of a new semester on campus. Y'all, I love it. I have it at the base of my TV, and I'm ready to watch the Tigers play on Saturday night, right? Uncommon Goods. Look, when you shop at Uncommon Goods, you're supporting artists and small independent businesses, and many of their handcrafted products are made in small batches. So shop now before they sell out this holiday season. Uncommon Goods looks for products that are high quality, unique, and often handmade or made in the U.S., they have the most meaningful, out-of-the-ordinary gifts anywhere. They even have gifts you can personalize. From holiday hosts and hostess gifts to the coolest finds for kids, to hits for everyone from the book lovers to diehard sports fans, Uncommon Goods has something for everyone, not the same old selection you can just find anywhere. And with every purchase you make at Uncommon Goods, they give $1 to a nonprofit partner of your choice. They've donated more than $3 million to date. 
So to get 15% off your next gift, go to uncommongoods.com slash R-L-R-C. That's uncommongoods.com slash R-L-R-C for 15% off. Don't miss out on this limit time offer. Uncommon Goods, we're all out of the ordinary. Hey, y'all, let me tell you about Mochi. Mochi is a telehealth platform that connects patients seeking medication-based weight loss treatment with board-certified doctors and dietitians to help them determine the best treatment options to accomplish that goal. Mochi's program is completely virtual, meaning you can access their services anywhere in the United States and you will be meeting with their team online. You deserve doctors that listen. Mochi is dedicated to providing holistic, patient-centered care that prioritizes overall well-being with the goal of transforming how weight management is approached. Mochi Health takes a holistic approach to weight loss that includes visit with board-certified doctors, nutrition consultations, and medications delivered to your door. Science-backed medications include GLP-1s like Ozempic and generic compound versions, affordable and accessible, regardless of insurance covers. With Mochi, their dietitians work hand-in-hand with your medication to create personalized nutrition plans that fit your lifestyle. Reach your weight loss goals with science-backed, FDA-approved GLP-1 medications and support from real doctors and guidance from registered dietitians and help with making easy and sustainable changes to achieve results. Y'all have seen this. My wife has done it. My brother-in-law has done it. One of my best friends is doing it, and it really is an amazing process that works. So get started at joinmochi.com and use code RLRC to receive $40 off. That's join, J-O-I-N-M-O-C-H-I.com and use code RLRC to receive $40 off and let Mochi help change your life and chain of custody on the evidence. So meanwhile, the, the manhunt was going on and Brandon Ashford, who was the canine handler, arrived, got the information on which direction the guy had run. Now, my partner, Jim Raffman, like I said, he was on the 2003 LSU National Championship team. He's a straight athlete. He's also on the special response team. Jim suited up in his special response team gear and went with Deputy Ashford on the track. Brandon's dog's name was Harry. The canine's name is Harry, and he was an awesome dog. Harry actually got his first canine apprehension one night on a guy that I was chasing on foot that had got away from me, and I've used him many, many times. So I knew that there's no doubt in my mind that they had the perimeter set up. They had this Christopher Pell contained in a certain area. It was just going to take a a certain amount of time to find him. And by this time, the helicopter is hovering overhead on scene. The K-9 starts to track. And in a short time later, the Louisiana State Police crime scene techs arrived, and they were admitted into the scene. They began to process it by photographing the location and covering the shell casing. The Ultimately, they recovered the firearm from whoever it was. And once they photographed Jenna's body and the coroner was there, we... Went up to Jana's body with the coroner and looked at it, and you could see the bullet hole into the right shoulder and the burn marks on her shirt from the gunpowder, which the bullet hole, and the which told me he wasn't maybe more than a foot away from her when he shot her from the, due to the tattooing or, or the tearing of the shirt. And but more importantly, or more horrifically, I should say, is the damage that. Christopher Pell did to Jana's neck. It was unreal. She was, and this is graphic, y'all, but it's the truth and it's real. She was definitely cut from side to side. It, the coroner got done looking at the body and they brought the body bag. We had to pick her up and put her in, in the body bag. When we did that, I had her head and when we went to pick it up, the only thing attaching her head to her body if you're looking down at her face was some skin on the right side of the neck i mean he almost decapitated her he just cut it all the way through he made sure he made damn sure that he was dead before he he ran like a little bitch so we placed her in the body bag and sealed it up and it's sealed and it's locked with an evidence number 
it, which is photographed and noted. And the next day at, at the autopsy, they would match up the number and photograph it again and, and, and document it when they break, actually break the seal. And again, that's to protect the, the chain of evidence, if you will. No defense attorney can say anything was added to the body after it was recovered. While Hunter comes up, Chief Grimes comes up and says, hey, you know, the mom and dad are here. They already know she's dead. Chuck Watts and I went to talk to him, and it was Mark and Nancy Stern, and we put him in one of our vehicles and you know, told him, I said, hey, you know, we're really, really sorry for your loss, and we're actively working a suspect. And Nancy said, we know he did it. We know that Christopher Pell killed her. I said, well, who's Christopher Pell? Tell us about it. And she said that's her husband. It had been together almost three years, and he was always abusive to her and controlling. And we know that he's beat on her several times, including recently that, that they were separated and she brought him some food, and, and he beat on her and raped her, and that was the final straw. And she finally agreed to divorce him. And in fact, we went last week to the courthouse and filed a restraining order against him, and he was served on Sunday. I'm like, uh oh. So I look at Chuck and he looks at me. Now, Chuck Watts is really, really long term detective, 20 plus years, and he's very, very good at what he does. And we, I jokingly called him Homicide Chuck because that's what he got most excited about were homicides and in, in internal affairs cases. And, and we look at each other. Cause as soon as she said, hey, he had a protective order, then we know it automatically takes this case to a death penalty case in the state of Louisiana. If you have a restraining order against someone and they kill you, it automatically makes it a death penalty case. So not that we weren't going to be on our utmost A game anyway, but this we know this is going to trial because no lawyer is just going to not fight it and have their client go to lethal injection. So the parents kept saying, how bad Pell was, and but then at the same time, they very distraught, but as I mentioned in episode one, they were very strong in their Christian faith, and the mom kept saying, I'm just, just so thankful that she came home, and she found Jesus again, and I know she's with God, and our baby's with Jesus, and, and I'm so glad that they had that faith to comfort them at, at that time. It's just, you know, pretty tra traumatic for the parents, uh, as you can imagine, but it, their faith really shone through during the time that we were talking to them. A few minutes later, I heard on the radio that, that was playing in, in the vehicle that we were sitting in, and I heard Deputy Randy Ashford say, Livingston, I'm 1015 with one white male, show a K-9 apprehension, which means that they had Christopher Pell in custody and they had to use the, the K-9 to get him. And so we concluded our interview with the parents, Chuck and I did, and we get out, and I called Jim Raffman on his cell phone. I said, hey, man, what happened? He said, we found him. He moved to a couple different locations, evidently, but we found him hiding under a trailer, and he refused to come out. And so Brandon sent in the canine, sent in Harry, and Harry had to bite on him to get him to comply. I said, well, how bad injured is he, Jim? And he said, he said it's not bad. I said, well, listen, this is what we need to do. I said, this is a death penalty case. The victim had a restraining order against him, so it's going to be a first-degree murder case. I said, I want you to transport him to, the, to our office, the detective office, but call for medical to meet you there. And hopefully he's not injured so bad that he needs to go to the hospital or anything, but if he does, we're going to get him there. But if not, we need him to sign a waiver stating that he doesn't need medical attention. So Chuck and I went to the detective office, and we were waiting, and some first responders from the fire department arrived and were waiting for Christopher Pell to get there, and then a Cadian ambulance arrived. And they brought Pell in. Jim Raffman and Brandon Ashford and several others were, were escorting him into our outer office, our waiting area, if you will. And so the first time I lay eyeballs on him, and he's a little frumpy. I don't want to say fat, but he's kind of fat, a little short dude, glasses and black hair, and just certainly unremarkable looking. And But he appeared to be real calm, and he had a couple injuries to him from the dog bite. And the medical people cleaned up the wounds and asked him, did he need to go to the hospital? And he, he refused medical attention. He said, no, I don't need to go anywhere. I'm fine. So they had him sign a refusal of medical service form stating that he didn't need help. And once we did that, we cleared everybody out. And Chuck and I go in and sit with Christopher Pell in our office. 
Chuck Watts breaks out the Livingston Parish Sheriff's Office standard Miranda rights and consent to question and form, and he read the form out to Christopher Pell, read him as Miranda rights, and Christopher Pell signed and stated that he understood. And he also signed and stated that he understood the consent to questioning part. And the consent to questioning part simply states that um, he understood his Miranda rights, and he consented to answer questions now, and he understood that he could, had the right to stop answering questions at any time for whatever reason he wanted to and to ask for a lawyer whenever he wanted to. And that no threats or promises had been made to him or no coercion had been used against him, and he signed it. And, we're, and as soon as it, he signed it and dated it, I stopped and I, I pulled my chair over. And I said, listen, man, I said, Christopher Pell said, I'm, I'm Woody Overton. I'm a detective here for the sheriff's office. I said, obviously, this is Detective Chuck Watts, who just advised you your Miranda rights. And before you say anything, I wanted to tell you how important what I'm about to say is. I said, it's probably going to be the most important thing you hear for the rest of your entire life. And I'm almost knee to knee to him now. Yeah, I've closed the distance. I put my hand on his leg and I'm maintaining eye contact with him. He's just sitting there with this look on his face looking at me. I said, Christopher, there's no doubt that you killed Jana Pill in Popeyes today. I said, we have all kinds of witnesses. Everybody saw it, right? You did it. You did not try to hide it. You shot her and then you chased her into the back of the store and, and you slit her throat. I said, now, you are either one, you're one of two types of people. Either you are a cold-blooded, sadistic murderer, or you're a husband who loved his wife and couldn't go on without her. I said, I know you got a whole nother level. I said, and a lot of times, Christopher, whenever homicides happen that aren't induced by person being high on narcotics or under the influence of alcohol i said there seems to always be a stressor that pushes that person over the edge to actually commit the homicide and i said i'm guessing your stressor is you were served with the protective order restraining order on sunday and and you, you realized you couldn't have her anymore and he shook his head yeah i said well here's the deal one thing that you forgot about christopher i said i don't know what you kind of lies you've been telling yourself while you're out there for four hours on the manhunt or how you think thought you were going to try to explain what you did to her i said let's say even all the eyewitnesses get it wrong i said the one thing you forgot about my brother is the eye in the sky i said and there is a camera right over that door pointing directly down where you murdered her i said now either you are a cold-blooded monster or your husband whose emotions got out of control. You know, at this point, I'm going for a confession, right? I mean, we obviously didn't have the cameras, but I didn't tell him the cameras were running. I just told him the camera was there pointing down on him. I'm going for the confession and to seal the case up. His eyes kind of big, and, and he sat there and he thought about it. And I said, I said, good. I said, take a moment. I said, think about exactly with how you ended her life. I said, not the gunshot at the counter. I said, that's bad. I said, but when you follow her into the back of the store and you walked calmly, the assistant manager said she followed you back there. She threatened you with the fire extinguisher, kept saying, come on, man, don't do this. And I'm going to hit you with the fire extinguisher. She said, you just calmly placed the pistol down. And then she grabbed it and she ran out. I said, well, then, you know, the real damage kicked in, man. I said, the, her neck was, it's pretty bad. I said, so... You know, the eye in the sky doesn't lie, brother. And I said, when that footage hits the news, oh, my God. I said, I mean, people are going to go crazy. So you have to be able to define who you are. You need to get out in front of this and tell me what kind of person you are. Are you a cold-blooded monster or are you just a husband who killed his wife because you were served with restraining order and... You lost your shit. I said, look, y'all were together for three years. I said, and now you know it's final and you snap. That's a whole big different tale than you going back there and brutally slicing her throat, almost cutting her head off. And he shook his head. He said, he said, no, 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 no. He said, I, I, I did it because I loved her. I did it because I loved her. And I said, okay, so hold on right there. I said, now, just tell me what happened. And he said that he got up that morning and 
called his cousin to come and get him and his mom. He wanted to take them to lunch at Ryan's Buffet, which is a, a cheap buffet that was located close to the Popeyes on the same strip. But first he told me, he said, I need to go to the pawn shop. And he said, I need to sell some jewelry so I can have some money to pay for lunch. They went to the Bayou Pawn Shop, and he went in. They waited in the car. And they said when he came out, he didn't appear to be carrying anything uh, when they were interviewed later. But Chris said he went in and completed the purchase of the pistol, a Kel-Tec 9mm, which he had started actually on Monday. He filled out the application because um, he knew that under a restraining order that once it got into the system, he wasn't going to be allowed to buy a gun. So he went in and he applied for it. He didn't know if it was going to be in the system or already in or not and evidently it wasn't because he passed the background check and he went back that day and completed the purchase and he bought the the pistol and a knife and a box of bullets and he said then they went to lunch at ryan's and again later on his mother and his cousin were interviewed and they said chris at lunch was just happy-go-lucky at several plates of food he was his normal self smiling and joking and when they got done with lunch, Chris said that he asked them to drop him off at the Walmart. And when they were pulling by the Walmart, his mama saw Jana's car at Popeye's. And his mama told him, said, no, don't you go over there and mess with that girl. Don't you go over there and mess with her. He said, oh, mom, I'm not going over there. And she said, well, how are you going to get home? He said, I'm, I'll catch a ride. Don't worry about it. He said, I love you. And I'll see y'all later. And he got out. Christopher stated that he went and hid by the dumpster. Uh, waiting for Janet to come out because he knew that she took the trash out. That was one of her jobs. But he said that some other girl brought the trash out and saw him. And then a little while later, the assistant manager came out and told him that he couldn't be waiting in the parking lot like that, that he had to go inside. He said he went inside, he confronted Janet at the counter, and that they started to argue. And he said, and I, I lost it. I shot her, and then I followed her back at the store when she ran and I killed her. And I said, how did you kill her? And I said, I mean, you gave up the gun. And I said, you tell me how you killed her. And he said, I, I cut her. And that's what he said. So I think maybe we talked to him for maybe 10 or 15 minutes from the time he signed the Miranda rights form until the time Chuck turned on the tape recorder. And Chris gave his, his tape confession to murder and Jana and the Popeyes. And at the end of the tape confession, Detective Watts asked Pell on tape, like we always do, and said, you know, do you feel that we treated you fairly today? And Pell said yes. And, you know, he said, uh, did we threaten you or promise you anything? And, and Pell said no. And so we concluded the tape part of the statement. And then we turned it off and called for Raffman to come get him and take him to the Hey, y'all. You want to set your child up for success? Is your child struggling with a specific subject or need help with the subject? Is your child ahead, not getting challenged enough in class? Well, IXL Learning is an online learning program that enriches your homeschool curriculum. It offers practice in math, English, language arts, science, and social studies while adapting to each child, meeting them where they are. Plus, IXL encourages students to become curious and empowers them to choose how to learn look we homeschool our son no doubt about it he's more of a visual learner and we use ixl and cindy teaches him and there are so many different benefits to the program it adapts to exactly what he needs in different areas so ixl is the perfect supplement to your homeschool curriculum ixl offers interactive practice problems educational games, lessons, and video tutorials for every topic you're teaching at home. It's easy to use, time-saving. Everything on IXL is organized by grade, subject, topic, and subtopic, making it simple to find activities for the exact skills you're covering. IXL offers instant feedback and explanations of new topics as kids use the program. Kids can explore any topic in any grade level they aren't forced into a single learning path like they are on other programs. If you're homeschooling your child because they were falling behind or because they were too far ahead like our son, IXL is a great program to help them get the exact support they need. 
Kids love IXL's positive feedback awards and educational games. IXL is trusted by 15 million students worldwide and has proven to improve performance in over 75 scientific research studies. Make an impact on your child's learning. Get IXL now. And Real Life Real Crime listeners can get an exclusive 20% off IXL membership when they sign up today at IXL.com slash today. Visit IXL.com slash today to get the most effective learning program out there at the best price. And don't forget, Real Life Real Crime listeners get 20% off. Y'all, we really do use this product and it's been a godsend. Hey, y'all, let me tell you about Gobble. All Gobble meal kits are pre-prepped. That means less work for you and less waste in your kitchen. Their meal kits include everything you need so you can save time at the store or just skip that trip entirely. I got the box in and I had three different meals. I had a Kung Pao chicken, crispy fish tacos, and a beef boom jignon. However you say it, but let me tell you about the classic beef boom jignon. Look, it came with beef pot roast and a beef broth concentrate, red wine demi glaze, cremini mushrooms, siapelloni onions, mashed potatoes, baby carrots, and rosemary thyme butter. It was so easy to make. Literally like 15 minutes it took Cindy. And let me tell you something. And all the dishes were fire. But this thing was like a taste explosion in my mouth. It's just un real we've got to spend more time together and more time doing the things we love because everything came in this one single box right to my door so see what a difference gobble will make for your household right now they're all for my listeners a fantastic limited time deal you get a hundred and twenty dollars off across four boxes plus free shipping and free cookies. And let me tell you, those cookies, I ate one that was sin baked and it was delicious. Go to gobble.com slash real life. That's G-O-B-B-L-E dot com forward slash real life for $120 off your first four boxes. This offer is not available on the home site, so don't miss out. This is genius. It's taste explosions in your mouth like you've never had jail and i told p i said listen one more thing brother before you leave i said you know the news media were out there i said it's going to be the lead story on the news of murder and popeyes i said they're going to be waiting on you at the jail for the perp walk and when they're going to bring you in in front of the cameras and they're going to be screaming questions at you i said they're going to ask you did you do it i said you need to get out in front of this brother i said you need to tell them you need to tell them say hey yeah i did it i did it because i loved her and yeah, you know, I said that's that's what you told us, right? I said so. You got to put a human face on Chris Pell because, as far as they know, you're just some monster who who cut your wife's head off at Popeyes. And when they put, took him to the jail for the perp walk, I didn't go, but he did it. The when when they were walking him in, uh, all the reporters were shouting questions, and one of them said, uh, "Christopher Pell, Christopher Pell, did, did you do this? Did you kill your wife?" And he said, "Yeah, I did it. I killed her because I loved her." <laughs> I mean, not only did we have him confessing to us and confessing on tape, but this genius goes and confesses to the whole world on public media, right? Certainly they can't say that we threatened him when he's shouting it out for everybody in TV land to hear. And you think that would be the end of the case. But really it was just the beginning of of the court process. And district attorney for the 21st Judicial is Scott Perlew, who's an excellent guy. He immediately came out in the press and stated that he was seeking the death penalty for Christopher Pell for murdering Jana while she was under protection of a protective order. And I believe that Scott Perley meant it, that he was going to seek the death penalty, but he ended up meeting with the family, Nancy and Mark Stern, and he explained the process to him, and he's brutally honest, and Charlotte Bear, the, the lead prosecutor, was there. And they were brutally honest with him about, hey, you know what, we'll do this. We'll go for the death penalty, and he certainly deserves it, and we can get it. We can win the conviction, but the process takes forever, and it's unfortunate, but it, the average death penalty case takes 18 to 25 years for it to come 
to the trial, which is certainly going to be a trial because it's a death penalty case. But from the time the trial concludes and he's found guilty, it could take 18 to 25 years because of the length of appeals involved in a death penalty case. And that's why y'all, I, I said it in another episode, it costs millions of dollars to put somebody to death in the state of Louisiana. And that's because of the length of time that they're housed, the 18 to 20 years, however long it takes. But more importantly, it's because of the cost of the attorney's fees and the cost of all the court hearings and everything else. Now, Christopher Pell is indigent, and so he's going to get a court-appointed attorney, and it's going to be a good one. In the state of Louisiana, you have to be certified to work a death penalty case to, to put on the defense for one. You can't just be any Joe Blow lawyer. So you're getting a top-notch lawyer for free. And if you lose on that case, then all kinds of lawyers are going to come in and that love to work death penalty cases and defend it, and they just drag it out forever. Scott Perillo told Mark and Nancy about it, and they just said that they couldn't do it. They couldn't go through that that process, and then they wanted closure. And that as long as he was locked away uh, where he could never hurt anybody else or, or do it to anybody else, then that's what they wanted. So first-degree murder is taken off the table, which drops it to second-degree murder, which means a guaranteed trial still because second-degree murder, the only punishment for it is upon conviction is life in prison without the possibility of parole and no defense attorney is going to plead their client to life in prison without the possibility of parole i mean you get a free shot at trial you might win something crazy might happen so leading up to the trial the first thing that happens of course is christopher pell was arraigned and by this time he had his attorney and he pled not guilty so we're going to trial And the second step that happened was a motion to suppress where the defense attorney tried to suppress Chris's confession, stating that, you know, we coerced him, et cetera. And it happens in every case, y'all, whether it's a death penalty case or second degree murder or rape, it doesn't matter. We get a confession, they always try to say we beat it out of them or whatever. So that motion was denied and the confession stood and was allowed for the trial. And then... Chris's attorneys took the angle that he was too dumb to participate in his own defense and to know what he was doing was wrong. And they said that his IQ was below the retardation level on on the point scale. And come to find out after they tested him, he, he wasn't in that point level on the IQ system. I mean, he, obviously he was smart enough to know what he was doing and smart enough to be able to say he understood his Miranda rights. And I have hundreds of thousands of hours of interview and interrogation and Pell was just as, as coherent and clear minded and intelligent as most people I interrogated. So that didn't fly. And then there were several more pretrial motions and Eventually, a year or so later, it came to trial. And, of course, I was subpoenaed and I was sequestered. And his trial got moved to courtroom three, which is upstairs in the Livingston Parish Courthouse. And it's the smallest courtroom. I mean, it's it's as small as the inside of a Popeye's eating area. Parish had grown so much that this old courthouse, it only had three courtrooms. And the two big ones were downstairs and the smallest one was upstairs. And... Mark and Nancy Stern had not attended any of the pretrial hearings or the motions to suppress or anything else. That they were just, just trying to not deal with it. And they didn't want to say his name. They didn't want to hear anything from him. Of course, they were prepped on what was going to happen in trial by Charlotte Abair, the lead prosecuting district attorney. And they said that they were waiting. It's a real tiny, narrow hallway where the elevator is on the third floor and the the door to courtroom three is directly across from the elevator, and our detective office door is right to the right of that. And so they were bringing them out from the detective's office and to go into the courtroom, and lo and behold, the door opens to the elevator, and there's Christopher Pell, and he's just looking at him. And Nancy became very upset, naturally. And the courtroom held like 20, 25 people. It was very small, so they had to sit real close to Pell, and they were upset about that. But the trial... Didn't take long. It, it, it took three days, and the witnesses testified, all the witnesses from the Popeyes, and it was everything that I told you. And then, you know, but some more 
things that they testified were, were like Jana was just the best person. And she had a voice of an angel, one of them said. She had a voice of an angel and always had a smile on her face, and, and she was awesome. Nancy Stern had told Chuck Watts and I in the, truck, in the vehicle that day that Jana was starting a new job the next day at Winn Dixie, which is a local grocery store, and it was a better paying job. She was excited about it. And in fact, on, on that day that Christopher Pell murdered her, she was supposed to go to legal aid to meet with her lawyer about her divorce. And before she left for work, the last time Nancy saw her alive, Nancy told her, said, you're not going to the legal appointment? She said, no, Mom, it's my last day at Popeye's. She said, I can't leave them short-shifted. It just wouldn't be the right thing to do. I'll make, I'll remake the appointment for the divorce attorney. I love you, and I'll see you later. And like Nancy said, that was the last time she saw her until the funeral. But the... The witnesses told what happened and testified. Well, now the defense rested, and Christopher Pell's defense in the, the opening arguments, his attorney states that they're not de- denying the fact that Christopher murdered Jana at Popeyes that day. The, the defense attorney said, the genius that he is, said that the their defense was going to be that. Christopher Pell had no specific intent or plan to go there to kill Jana that day. And simply he went there to talk to her about reconciling. And then he stated that he brought the gun so he could coerce her to have a conversation with him. And Detective Ballard, Ben Ballard, testified that he was with the state police when they collected the firearm and that the firearm, the pistol, had one bullet that was jammed in the chamber which means that christopher pell only put two bullets in the pistol the defense attorney says that this was he could have loaded up the full magazine and this this proves that he only went there to talk to her and that didn't prove anything let me tell you why that i firmly believe that christopher pell went there with the intent in his mind to shoot and kill Jana, and then turn the fire on himself and shoot him and kill himself but he failed at that like everything else in life when the gun jammed but most of the time when people decide to commit suicide like that and they're not under the influence of narcotics or alcohol they'll come to reach a peace with themselves and they like they'll give away their most prized possessions or they'll take their family to lunch like he did with his his mom and his cousin and and they'll be in a good mood because they're already resigned that they're going to die and they're they're at peace with it right but he was going to kill jenna first but the defense attorney says, no, 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 he only put two bullets in a gun because he didn't have any intentions of shooting her. Well, I mean, okay, whatever. So that was his defense, and that he had no specific intent. He only went there with the intentions to talk to her, and it, therefore it wasn't second-degree murder where you planned it out. But the re- retired and went to the jury, and the jury came back. In 36 minutes, they decided that Christopher Pell was guilty of second-degree murder, uh, it was a unanimous verdict, and the Honorable Judge Brenda Ricks presided over the trial, and on the sentencing date, she sentenced Christopher Pell to life without the possibility of probation or parole at hard labor at Louisiana State Penitentiary at Angola. And y'all, for Christopher Pell, this might be one where it, him doing life in the general population at Angola is actually harder than death because I can promise you those guys up there have a field day with him every day. My heartfelt sympathies go out to the Stern family like they do to all the victims' families, but like I said, they were very strong in their faith, and Nancy Stern ended up writing a book named Sufficient grace if you have a chance read it 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 talks about their faith and and everything and that the the ordeal that they went through and they said that they've forgiven christopher pell although they haven't forgot about it they've forgiven him and but i can tell you what they certainly have forgot about it because when you read the book she never mentions pell's name she just says that guy that guy until she has to about the trial and then the final reason I know they haven't forgotten about it is on Jana's tombstone, it reads, Jana Lynn Stern, born August 26, 1983, dash, murdered by her ex-husband. I think that says it all. 
So with that, we're going to conclude this episode of Real Life, Real Crime, the podcast. But we have to do the sphincter scale, y'all. And if you've been following our episodes, you know that sphincter scale goes from one asshole to ten assholes. being One being someone who should barely be in trouble to ten being uh, a person who deserves the death penalty. And Christopher Pell... I can't give him a 10 as as horrific as it was. I can't give him a 10 because he's just such a wuss and he brutally murdered this young lady that he had been beating on and manipulating for years. And he's just a little bitch of a man in my opinion. So I'm going to give him an eight, not because the crime doesn't deserve to be a 10 or above a loser woman abuser. So, and I want to talk about one more thing real quick and then we'll end. And that is I've been getting a lot of response on the sphincter scale and people saying that I should have a rating above 10 because like David Constance from our first episode, I mean, that if that guy is definitely above a 10, right? I and mean, way above a 10. And so I had to come up with a different ranking if you're above a 10. So I'm going to use some Louisiana, South Louisiana terminology and tell you about the bayou okay and the bayou is a slow moving body of water generally in a swamp and i actually live on an island in the swamp i have the amy river across the street from me in my front yard and a private canal in the back and we're surrounded by bayous but down here they say if you want to get rid of a body and you can get rid of one and you simply by putting it in the bayou because everything that eats flesh lives in the bayou you have fish and crawfish and turtles and of course our favorite alligators right i mean i have alligators in my yard all the time so if you if you're a 10 or above we're gonna throw you in the bayou but if you take that upon yourself to give that person uh, a 10 and put them in the bayou and then it'll be murder by you and we'll do a play on words i'm going to call it instead of spelling the b-a-y-o-u we're going to spell it B Y dash Y O U. So in the future, if you find one of our bad guys or girls to be above a 10, it's going to be murder by you. And once again, we thank everybody for listening. We love y'all. You're awesome. And we appreciate you. And till next time, I'm your host, Woody Overton. Oh,